Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we launched during the work from home period with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do during SALT Talks is provide the same type of experience that we provide at our global conference series, the SALT Conference. And our two guests today, we're very excited to have them on, have both spoken at our in-person SALT conferences, and we're looking forward to having them back at our next in-person SALT conference, hopefully uh, in 2021. Uh, but what we're trying to do is really provide a window into the minds of subject matter experts, as well as to provide a platform for big ideas that we think are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to bring you a SALT talk focusing on the digital asset space, uh, featuring Michael Sonnenschein and Dan Moorhead. Uh, Michael Sonnenschein is the Managing Director at Grayscale Investments, the world's largest digital currency asset manager, with more than $5.9 billion in assets under management across its family of 10 products. Uh, Michael oversees the daily operations and growth of the business, uh, in addition to maintaining many of the firm's key client relationships, including with financial advisors, family offices, hedge funds, and other institutions, as well as managing the development of Grayscale's single asset and diversified digital currency products. Uh, prior to joining Grayscale, Michael was a financial advisor at J.P. Morgan Securities, and prior to that, he was an analyst at Barclays Wealth. Uh, he earned his Bachelor in Business Administration from uh, the Goizueta School of Business at Emory University, which is also my alma mater, uh, and his MBA from the Leonard Stern School of Business at New York University. Uh, Dan Moorhead, our other guest today, founded Pantera in 2003, uh, managing a billion dollars in hedge fund strategies primarily focused on the digital asset space. Uh, Pantera is the first institutional investment firm focused exclusively on Bitcoin and other digital currencies, as well as companies operating in the blockchain tech ecosystem. Uh, Pantera launched the first cryptocurrency fund in the United States when Bitcoin was trading at $65 per coin in 2013. And Dan, thank you so much for uh, calling me in 2013 to tip me off about this great new technology called Bitcoin, uh, but we'll talk about that offline after the webinar. Uh, the firm Pantera subsequently launched the first exclusively blockchain venture fund and recently concluded raising its third venture fund. Uh, in 2017, Pantera was the first firm to offer a pre-auction ICO fund. Uh, Pantera's Bitcoin fund has returned over 16,000% in seven years and has returned billions of dollars to its investors. Pantera currently manages around 700 million in capital in seven funds and three product groups, including a passive fund, a hedge fund, and a venture capital fund. A reminder, if you have any questions for Michael or Dan during today's SALT talk, you can enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen on Zoom. And hosting today's talk and making his SALT talks debut is Brett Messing, who is the uh, President and Chief Operating Officer at Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brett for the interview. So I'm going to start with, with you, Dan. You and I sort of uh, crossed paths at Goldman Sachs years ago. I'm going to, we're the same age. I'm very new to Bitcoin, but I have the, the zeal of the converted. You're sort of a Bitcoin OG. So can you uh, tell us how you, uh, how you made the path from Wall Street into uh, Bitcoin? Yeah, so I spent my career in global macro. Uh, lastly, I was with Tiger Management, where I worked with Julian Robertson, looking for interesting disruptions around the world. Um, you know, uh, Russian privatization or Argentine farmland or Tesla Motors, you know, every three or four years, something like that would come up. And in 2011, I got uh, introduced to Bitcoin. Took me a year or two to get my head around it because it's a, you know, it's a, a kind of a trippy concept to have non-state sponsored money. But ultimately came to believe it was going to disrupt finance, wealth storage, dozens of different industries in a way that the internet had disrupted everything else, but hadn't really touched finance or, or you know, gold or, or money. And all those things are the largest markets on earth. And so the opportunity was gonna be orders of magnitude bigger than all those previous trades. Wow. Um, well, I'm late, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. Hey, uh, Michael, you're, you're so young that we, we understand why you're in Bitcoin. So I have a different <laughs> question for you which is today Grayscale announced, you know, some incredible fundraising numbers. Uh, in your digital funds, you guys raised a billion dollars this quarter, 2.4 billion this year, which is just fantastic and great for the space. Thank you. You just talk a little bit about where you're seeing the funds flow in from and, uh, you know, what sort of catalyzed that, that sort of substantial increase? 
Sure. So yeah, this uh, this morning we released our uh, third quarter report, which looks at investment activity across our our ten products. And this is kind of not kind of this is our third record breaking uh, quarter in a row. Uh, about 80% of the investment that we're getting is coming from institutions. Um, a lot of that is being done by hedge funds. And I think what's really interesting, particularly for those who attend SALT or who are allocators or who are at funds, is that we're realizing and trying to put this message out there that it's not for any one kind of investor, which I think a lot of people think that it is. I think the broad swatch of investors engaging in our products, getting exposure to digital currency are everywhere from global macro funds to risk arb funds to value, momentum. It's really all across the board. Um, and so I think for us, the rate and the pace at which we're seeing investment, not to mention that investors are not only just looking at Bitcoin, but also diversifying across other digital assets has been really encouraging. And so it's just pretty much at this point generally accepted this asset class is here to stay and everyone's trying to figure out where this fits within their portfolio construction. All right, that's a good sort of launching off point. So the name of this, this, this talk is Digital Assets and I'm gonna out myself as a, as a Bitcoin maximalist. So, right, we, need, we have one search engine, Google, right? We have one mobile provider, Apple, we have Amazon. Why do we need anything more than Bitcoin? I'm gonna to go to Dan first, and then I'll come back to you on Mike, Michael on this one. Sure. Yeah, I would say that, you know, you just listed a couple of different interesting use cases. There are lots of different use cases in cryptocurrency. There's wealth storage, the digital gold version of it. There's cross-border money movement. There's the you know, property titles on the blockchain. There's hundreds of different use cases. And when a technology is disruptive, they call it a category killer. Blockchain's a serial killer. It's gonna go through dozens of different <laughs> industries. But they don't need to be all the same. Like Bitcoin's amazing at wealth storage, it's digital gold, but it's not very good at smart contracts or other you know, uh, programmable money type of applications. So I think you're gonna see a single digit number of important blockchains 10 years from now. Not one and not 500, but you know, it, it will be a handful. And one of my thoughts on that would be, it's kind of like in the 90s being a Yahoo maximalist. You know, Yahoo was a good company, but there were 20 other really important companies you needed to invest in. The same with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's very important, but there's, you know, there's, a, there's some others that you should have some exposure to. Okay. Um, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, Dan has been in the space even longer than I have. I'm, I'm coming up on seven years. And I think we both agree that while, you know, probably today the killer use case for something like Bitcoin may be that digital store of value or, you know, digital gold, um, that there are so many other use cases out there to be developed for Bitcoin and other digital assets that were pretty much probably still at the beginning or maybe bottom of the first inning of kind of where this asset class is going to go. We don't believe that it is a winner take all scenario, Brett. I think that as this asset class evolves, there will ultimately be some cohort of digital currencies that exist side by side as, as a family, right? The same way you might look at the precious metals family. And each of those assets will likely have different use cases, different addressable markets, different prices, all part of building out a bona fide asset class around digital assets. And it's just too early to say, you know, who the winners will be, who the losers will be. But certainly I think investors now appreciate that. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot of diversification. Um, although for most investors, their first foray into the asset class usually still is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, what's interesting is some, you know, a guy, as I said, I, I am new to it and buying Bitcoin felt like a big deal you know, my interest in buying anything else, at least right now, maybe when I learn more, I'll feel differently. And I just, it just seems to me that for the next leg of growth is probably more people to look like me, but I'm new, so I'll defer to you guys, but that's just, just one person's perspective. Can, can you, you know, one of the things that I think is challenging about Bitcoin, we were talking about a little bit before we started, is, or digital currencies just generally, is explaining it to someone. And I actually taught at UCLA for a while and I used to tell people you have to be able to explain something in one or two sentences or you don't understand it. I, I'd like each of you to give our audience your sort of why Bitcoin, why buy it now, your, your sort of elevator pitch if you don't mind. I, I think that would be helpful. Um, 
I'm going to answer that, uh, Brett, with my kind of aha moment around Bitcoin, um, which was that I think that I believe that Bitcoin can be the springboard to financial inclusion. Um, I think the fact that the world has gone digital, money by and large has not. Um, everyone around the world has a phone, whether it's a brand new iPhone 12 or a simple feature phone. All you need is a phone or any kind of connectivity to send and receive Bitcoin. In much the same way that the advent of the cell phone totally leapfrogged the communications game, especially in the emerging markets uh, where there weren't landlines, Bitcoin in a digital form of money that's global and borderless and basically lets you move value instantaneously and for free should be one of the catalysts that creates financial inclusion globally. And Brett, I'd say that the way I think it's easier for people to get their head around it is it's essentially the final piece of the protocol puzzle that is the internet. So the internet has all these protocols like TCP, IP that move all kinds of data around. And in the 90s, Milton Friedman said the only thing missing was a reliable e-cash system. And that's essentially what Bitcoin is and what these other blockchains are. It's a way to move financial value around without the very expensive intermediaries. And those intermediaries really haven't changed. If you think about how much the internet changed everything else in our lives, shopping, you know, social, all these things are completely different. But banks, remittance companies, credit card companies, they're pretty much the same as they were in the 60s, right? A credit card is a piece of plastic with some eight-track tape glued to the back of it <laughs> and very expensive. So, you know, it really hasn't been hit by the internet and that's basically what blockchain is. And the analog I like to use is it's going to do to finance what VoIP did to the telecoms monopolist. You know, back in the day when we were in college, it was really expensive to make an international phone call because every American had to use AT&T and every Brit had to use British Telecom. When we realized you could route voice over the internet, VoIP, rates went down to essentially zero. It's, it's free to stream Netflix on your iPhone now. And the quantity of calls went up so much that we don't even have enough copper on earth to run the internet if we were still run on copper. And that's basically what Bitcoin and blockchain will do. It's going to route money over the internet. So money over IP. And Dan, I think you've made up a really good point, which is that this whole system we have today around moving value, it's all based on mistrust, right? I don't trust you. You don't trust me. That's why there's a bank in the middle, or that's why you know we have a credit card processor or whoever it is in the middle of everything we do. And Bitcoin completely democratizes that and allows totally unknown parties to transact with each other in a way that is trusted. Um, and so it, it, it can really eliminate a lot of those frictions and time and money that go into moving value. Yeah, it's, it's not just between you and I who live in developed uh, economies. Sure. Great financial services. I, I like your point about financial inclusion. There's uh, three and a half billion people on earth that have a smartphone, and only one billion of those have banks like you and I would recognize, you know, uh, those types of accounts. So there's several billion people that a lot of people call unbanked, but in my mind, that, that word itself is an anachronism. Huh. You know, it's like calling them unlandlined. You know, they never got a landline, they went straight to mobile phones, they're not going to get a bank. They're going straight to mobile money and Bitcoin is the solution. So, you know, there, there's been a lot discussed that, you know, the use case for countries, right, where the currency's collapsing, right? You know, I guess Bitcoin is at an all-time high against the Turkish lira. It's at an all-time high against the Argentina, uh, Argentine peso. Is there any evidence that there are flows coming from these countries? In other words, or is it just like an academic concept that, well, no, this sense for them. There, there's empirical data there. I mean, I think the, the analog that Dan and I are talking about is only made worse in geographies where governments are inflating their currencies or manipulating their currencies. I mean, a lot of people in, in these areas of the world wake up and whatever value they had yesterday, you know, they wake up today and it's worth 20% less um, and nothing really happened um, that they were in control of that, that caused that to be the case. And so those types of folks in those parts of the world are looking for really 
any way to protect their purchasing power. And they have a serious mistrust of their government and their government's ability to regulate and, and, and administer their currency. And so, you know, our parent company, Digital Currency Group, has investments in digital currency exchanges all over the world, including in parts of South America, Southeast Asia, et cetera. And the volumes continue to just demonstrate in all of these companies how much growing interest in their user base um, and people actually using Bitcoin in a lot of these different geographies. So it, it is really happening. So the part of the reason why I ask, Michael, you and I talk about this is, you know, as I said, I just bit, bought Bitcoin and, and we talk about this being sort of this trust, you know, sy system of trust. It's weird to buy it, you know, in terms of, you know, it's on my phone. I got two factor authentication. Now I got a security key. I've never bought anything that I've had to spend so much time thinking about protecting. And I finally have it in a place that I think is protected. Can, can we discuss like, what you see in terms of, and Grayscale has done this, but it feels like we need easier on-ramps. And I'm sitting here in Manhattan, and that's why I wonder if I was in Turkey, what's my on-ramp look like? And are they, again, because it, it feels like I've invested in a DraftKings account and there are too many zeros there for a <laughs> DraftKings account. So do you have a reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, every day that goes by, it is becoming orders of magnitude easier for folks to buy um, transfer, hold, and safe keep digital currencies. Um, Dan's business, my business, you know, we're, we're trying to eliminate a lot of those frictions and open up access to folks so they don't have to navigate some of that. But pretty much every geography you can think of around the world, there is an exchange or exchanges or order books uh, where individuals can buy and sell digital currencies against their local fiat money. Um, and you're totally right. Um, digital currencies are not for the faint of heart. There are complexities around them that make them more challenging for a lot of folks than handling cash or handling a stock or handling a bond because they are a bearer instrument. And so I think one of the things that we're excited about and monitoring very closely is how all that infrastructure is being built to make it more foolproof and user friendly for folks to handle digital currencies as seamlessly as they might handle airline miles, um, you know, their Apple Pay, or even just SMSing Bitcoin from one user to another if you don't live in the developed world and you're just using a simple feature phone. So a lot of that is being built out, but it's again, still early days. And that exact experience you're having is evidence again of how early we are in the cycle of where everything is probably headed. And um, Dan, do you think we'll get larger, you know, either more regulatory relief coming with a new administration or, you know, will I be able to buy this in a Schwab account? You know, what do you see in terms of the, the regulatory and on-ramping landscape, if you will? Yeah, you know, that's obviously a really important issue for institutional investors is, you know, what's happening on the regulatory front. And I think we have to be conscious that the U.S. government has been pretty far ahead of this curve and even in 2013 made a lot of rulings that are very positive for Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, the IRS ruled in 2013 that if you hold it for more than a year, you get capital gains tax treatment, which is way better than you get with holding gold, which is a collectible. Uh, and normal currencies, fiat currencies, are always ordinary income. If you held the euro for 20 years and sold it at a profit, you have to pay ordinary income tax on that. So most of the regulatory bodies have ruled um, the last one really is the SEC. It hasn't been completely clear on what things are securities and when things are not securities. But the, the last big announcement is the OCC has given permission to any nationally chartered bank to custody crypto. That's wild, right? Like your issue with yeah, you got all these two-factor authentication things you have to deal with. Going forward, you're going to be able to just custody your, you know, your Bitcoin at your nationally chartered bank. And then the kind of the brain friction that you were just talking about goes away because it's just going to be like any other account you have at your nationally chartered bank. Uh, so most of that regulatory stuff is, is really behind us. Yeah. And Brett, I don't even think most people even know what the OCC is, or maybe at least didn't before this announcement came out. The Office of the Control of the Currency. And I think for folks like Dan and his team and, and, and folks like my team and, and others around us, 
this is a very, very meaningful asset, uh, uh, announcement from the OCC. When you think about um, regulatory clarity or lack thereof, we're not hearing that from investors anymore as it being a gating item to them deploying capital into this asset class. They actually feel that there is quite a bit of regulatory clarity and that's not what may hold them up from investing. But thinking about holding digital assets um, at a nationally chartered bank is also causing all of the banks who I think for a long time have developed working groups and sandboxes and proofs of concept to move off of zero and realize that they're actually going to need to deal with this asset class. And there isn't a better time than now for them to figure out what's their approach going to be and are they going to be late to the party um, or, you know, stand to, to lose business to other banks who move faster than they do. So it, it, it seems like the, the, we're getting de-risked from a regulatory standpoint. I guess, Dana, you've been in this for a bit. Over the last three years, are there, are there other risks that had tended to be gating items for people that you think have been mitigated meaningfully? Yeah, there, there was one final one, custody. Uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I was evangelizing uh, institutional investors on investing, and some did and, and got rewarded. Uh, our first fund's up 140x, so, you know, there, there definitely was some reward for taking the risk, but custody's been a legitimate uh, gating item for institutional investors. The, as I said, the regulatory stuff mainly went away a few, four or five years ago, uh, but the custody thing was, was a real issue. And in the last two years, there have been some massive regulated custodians that have come out and it makes it just so much easier for a fiduciary to allocate capital to the Bitcoin space. You have uh, the New York Stock Exchange's parent has a company called Back that does custody. Fidelity does custody. Uh, Coinbase is now massive and well trusted. Uh, BitGo is, is one of the largest custodians within the blockchain space. And all those are highly regulated, you know, have all the um, regulation that, that a institutional investor would want. So that, I think that's really helped open the door to much larger institutional investment. So, so uh, I, I have a question which I'm going to ask both of you, which I, with, I, I ask with love as a Bitcoiner, which is, you know, we have this sort of amazing macro environment for Bitcoin, right? Where incredible fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus. We have Paul Tudor Jones putting 2% of his fund in it. We have Michael, we have MicroStrategy, a public company putting 425 million in. We have Square putting $50 million in. We have Grayscale vacuuming up almost all the Bitcoin that's mined. So it just leaves me wondering, why aren't we above last year's high? Uh, the Bitcoin price. Do you, do you want to go first, Dan? you have any thoughts on that? It just, it doesn't, it feels like as a Bitcoiner, you couldn't have asked for a better sequencing event in this year. And yet we haven't breached the high of 19. Yeah. So that, that'd be my main, um, argument for why someone should put two or 3% of their net worth into Bitcoin is you love being invested in an asset where people are complaining it's only up 60% year to date in a global depression pandemic crisis. So, you know, that would be my argument is it's up, you know, a hundred percent from four or five months ago. Uh, it's up, you know, 60% year to date. And over the next year or two, I think it will hit new highs. Um, the Bitcoin market goes in these two or three year cycles. It averages 209% compound annual growth rate over the last nine years with all the macro tailwinds and the fundamentals. I would think it's going to outpace that over the next couple of years. So, you know, it's a nice problem to have that we're, we're kind of griping that it's only up 60. And the, the Bitcoin maximalist in you would, would lead me to, to point out that other things in the blockchain space are massively outpacing Bitcoin. You know, we're, we're very bullish on Bitcoin, but other things have done well. Ethereum's up almost 200% year to date. So the blockchain space, you know, is, is really surging, uh, you know, kind of a good mix of all the assets is a, a fund we run that, that invests in all the major currencies, uh, trades them on a long short basis. It's up 122% this year. So the market is ripping. Um, it's, you know, in the next couple of years, we'll probably see more of that. Right. I think, um, you know, I, I've been through quite a few bubbles and bursts in the Bitcoin price and, um, if you kind of look at the repetitive nature of this, um, Bitcoin kind of goes through these big bubbles, it bursts, it kind of bases for a while, and then kind of makes its next move. I think 
um, certainly one thing that we probably would not want to see is just one of these parabolic moves um, out of nowhere because they're just not sustainable um, and they don't necessarily inspire a ton of investor confidence. Um, but typically when you see Bitcoin going through this kind of range bound time where it is now flirting between kind of 10 and $12,000, it usually predates a pretty dramatic move in the Bitcoin price, either to the upside or to the downside. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing a period of more sustained um, price movement, um, just kind of being in this range bound area, really has to do with the development of a much healthier two sided market. You know, one of the things that I think has been a catalyst to draw a lot more investors into this asset class is the development of the derivatives market around digital assets, Bitcoin and others, um, a really healthy lending and borrowing market, um, the ability for folks to short. I mean, a lot of the institutions that we deal with would not be making their Bitcoin investments in the way or the magnitude that they are if they weren't having the ability to put on a bona fide hedge um, against those positions. Um, and that really, again, speaks to kind of the build out of the infrastructure. And to Dan's point, um, whether it's custodianship, the development of the futures on CME Group, what BACT is doing at NYSC, all of these are really important developments. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it, it's, it, it feels like it's grown up a lot, right? In addition, you have, you know, very big four accounting firms, right, willing to write audits about it. And, you know, MicroStrategy and Square, you know, submitting SEC filings, you know, with, with it on their balance sheet. So I think it's interesting. It, it feels like more and more people are talking about it as digital gold. Dan, is that the right way to think about it? And does the macro trader in you like the idea of a long Bitcoin short gold trade? Oh, yeah, I'd love that trade. You know, gold's been awesome for 5,000 years, but it's a little past its sell-by date. And Bitcoin is the 21st century version of gold. You can do everything you can. The same as gold is a fixed quantity. You know, it's like the gold standard. Uh, but you can, you know, send it in one second to anyone anywhere on Earth, essentially for free, which is different if you have a lot of your savings as a, a brick of gold in a vault in Zurich. So uh, digital gold is one of the many use cases of blockchain. Bitcoin's a fantastic version of that. And you're seeing it in countries like China used to be one of the largest importers of gold. It's now one of the largest importers of Bitcoin. It's just a great way to store your wealth, get it out of uh, banking systems that might be suspect. Um, so I think one of the great use cases of, of Bitcoin is digital gold. And with all the money printing that's happening right now, it's very much front and center. All the, the gold bugs that I know are, are at least shifting some of their assets into Bitcoin. And, and you mentioned Paul Tudor Jones. He wrote in his investor letter a few months ago, it reminds him of gold in the 70s. And I think that's a great analog that in the 70s, we were heading into a, a period of very high global inflation. The US even had the long bond go to 13%. Uh, and gold performed very well. I think we have an even bigger version of that now. And if, if you're talking about the global macro story, um, the, the numbers that the U.S. is printing are, are literally off the charts. In June, the United States printed more dollars than they did in the first 200 years of our country's history. So if, you know, if your choice is own dollars, own gold, or own Bitcoin, you know, I would go all Bitcoin. But if you're a normal investor that hasn't spent eight years thinking about it, you might as well put three or four percent of your assets in Bitcoin. Right. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, Brett, I don't know if this predates your getting um, involved in, in the Bitcoin space and, and becoming a Bitcoin maximalist, but my team actually devoted the better part of last year to a national advertising campaign uh, called hashtag drop gold. Um, we feel uh, quite fervently that the next generation of investors, those who haven't even hit their prime earning years yet, will not be investing in gold. Uh, it doesn't resonate with them. It's not something that they are gonna have had a tangible experience with the way that they are buying things like Apple and Netflix and, um, and are growing up in a, in a time when the things that they're important uh, to them are their airline miles and their credit card points and paying their friends on Venmo and, and buying Bitcoin. And so we think that, you know, with over $68 trillion passing over the next 25 years from 
older generations, you know, baby boomers um, down to millennials and, and younger generations, that the way that those assets are currently postured today are going to change as that generational wealth transfer happens. And we're not going to go out and say we think all 68 trillion of it is moving into Bitcoin and digital currency, but we'd be hard pressed to believe that some portion of it um, doesn't make its way into crypto. And um, that's already starting to happen. You know, Schwab put out this survey last year looking at what the top 10 equity holdings were for millennials, I think Gen Xers, and then baby boomers. And you guys wouldn't be surprised what they're invested in. They own stocks like Apple and Disney and Berkshire Hathaway, but noticeably, the millennial segment, their fifth largest holding was Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust, right? They're, they're already allocating to this asset class and the empirical data is there. Uh, so that, that's kind of our view on it. And uh, while gold is, as Dan said, had, had its time, um, we, we do believe that, you know, digital gold or a digital form of inflation hedge, things like that, uh, Bitcoin can really serve that role in a lot of investors' portfolios. Well, I guess it, it, in the spirit of, of sort of the world changing, I saw yesterday that PayPal's market cap is bigger than Bank of America's and Square's is bigger than Goldman Sachs's. So <laughs> that would, which is amazing to me. Um, it makes one think that why shouldn't Bitcoin be bigger than gold, which, which I, I, I guess is a, a good transition point to, Dan, how does someone value this? Like, you know, how do you, how do you think about it in terms of, it's undervalued, it's overvalued. You know, I've, I don't know that we have time to get into the stock to flow model, but right there, there are different ways that people are trying to value it by, by analogy. I don't know if they make sense, but I'd be curious in your thoughts and then yours also, Michael. Yeah, I had a fun argument with one of my Tiger Cub friends who runs a big TMT fund. He said, hey, there are no cash flows to discount, so we can't invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> And, you know, I just, I love that mentality. It's like, well, where are the cash flows of gold? And it's worth $10 trillion, right? Everyone's gotten their head around that. So uh, part of the argument is just supply and demand. There's 21 million Bitcoins. Uh, eight, 10 years ago, there was probably 50,000 people on earth that thought Bitcoin was interesting and, and they should own a, a bit. Uh, a few years ago, it was 500,000. Now it's probably 50 million people. And if, you know, five years from now, it's 500 million people, the price will be higher. And it is as simple as that. Uh, and people, you don't really even need to know why people want to use it. Some people are using it as uh, migrants sending money back home to their parents in their home country. Uh, some people are using it to store wealth uh, because they think their banking system might be bankrupt in their country. Um, you know, there's, there's hundreds of different use cases and the more people that do that. Um, you can do relative value analysis between the different blockchains. So you can say, you know, I think Polkadot is cheap relative to Ethereum or, you know, I think Bitcoin is cheap. You know, Bitcoin right now is 58% of the entire market cap of, of the industry. Uh, that's been as uh, high recently as almost 70 and it's been as low as 33. So you can make those kinds of, of views. But ultimately, it really is a bet on whether you think at 350 billion, which is the total market cap of the entire blockchain uh, cryptocurrency industry, is that appropriate? It's a very small fraction of what gold is. It's uh, currencies are 100 trillion, and there's a lot of really crappy ones out there. Uh, so Bitcoin can definitely take market share over. There's 200 currencies on Earth. You know, Bitcoin could probably replace about 150 of them. Uh, you know, there's some really bad currencies out there. So, you know, to my mind, that's the easiest way to value it is to think, hey, it's uh, 350 billion. It's competing with things that are tens of trillions, hundreds of trillions. And, you know, if it has a 20% chance of getting, you know, a 20% market share in cash, it's going to be a 10x type trade, you know, so that is the basics. You do see some Wall Street firms trying to do these very fundamental analyses of adding this and that and discounting it and stuff. I, I'm, I'm very suspect on those. I think it, it, it's more of a, you know, speculative trade is definitely very volatile, but if you choose to uh, invest, you're thinking, you know, I'm risking 1x my money and I might make, you know, 10, 20, 30x my money. Um, I think Dan's exactly right. And the way he just started that off with, a friend of his sharing that you know he couldn't come up with a with a traditional model to try and value Bitcoin is is actually exactly where where we end up as well. It's frustrating that you know a lot of investors are trying to take an asset like Bitcoin, which didn't even exist 10, 12 years ago, 
in trying to throw it through the same kind of valuation models and metrics that they would for Bank of America stock or a municipal bond or whatever it may be. The truth is that as an investment, Bitcoin doesn't have any of the same attributes as those do. And so when you look at trying to value it, um, you really have to take that entire lens off and look at it in a very different way. Um, my team just just authored a report called actually valuing Bitcoin um, because we're, we're, we're experiencing this so much with our investors. And in the report, we probably go through about eight or 10 different metrics that individuals and institutions can look at to try and determine the health of Bitcoin and whether or not there are certain signals that we can pay attention to to help determine Bitcoin's value. Um, some of those things include dormancy, right? We can look at how long Bitcoins are being held, right? The blockchain gives us that forensic tool to allow folks to understand, are people holding on to their Bitcoins longer or are they moving around more? Are more Bitcoins sitting on exchanges, meaning that they're more likely to be bought and sold or are more of them sitting off exchanges and in wallets because people are holding them and speculating on the price movement? You know, there's a lot of different analytics that we can look at and they just don't resemble anything like a discounted cash flow or anything of the sort. I think outside of looking at blockchain analytics, a lot of folks do look at Bitcoin, to Dan's point on Wall Street, about maybe markets that Bitcoin stances disrupt. So if there is a couple hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in existence today, maybe just look at the market cap of, of, of gold. There's a couple trillion dollars of gold, right? If you apply some percentage that you think Bitcoin is going to take of the gold market um, with some probability, you know, you get to some pretty crazy number quite quickly if Bitcoin captures one, two, three, five percent of the investable market for gold. And so a lot of folks start messing around with metrics like that or taking share of the M2 money supply, things of that nature. But ultimately, the best way that we've seen people really look at this is looking at the underlying metrics that the blockchain provides. I think people need to realize that it's just Bitcoin, right? It's just a new thing and, and you can't value it the way you, all the, all the, these analyses feel somewhat tortured to me. You know what I mean? Um, uh, it feels like it's likely to go up and trying to figure out how much it will go up. feels like, a, you know, how do you value a, a Honus Wagner rookie baseball card? There you go. Exactly. There, you know, one of the examples I love using on that, when people say, you know, I'm not going to buy Bitcoin because there's no intrinsic value. You know, first, the U.S. dollar has no intrinsic value. They just printed a trillion of them in June, right? Like there's, there's nothing behind that. But the, the better example would be the intrinsic value of a Jackson Pollock painting is 40 bucks, right? They have some house paint, some canvas, but, you know, it's got a 70 year track record of appreciating. So it's a good asset to hold. Bitcoin's track record is only 11 years, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's as, as good as Jackson Pollock, but, you know, 10 years from now, that'll be 20 years. And, and every decade that it adds, it, you know, adds more credibility to its long-term compounding annual growth rate. Yeah, and I think, Brett, one of the things that we've been talking about with a lot of investors, especially in this environment, is Bitcoin's verifiable scarcity. So people are looking often at how much fiscal stimulus is being injected into the system, in contrasting that with the finite amount of Bitcoin that will ever enter circulation. And so it's almost as though when supply and demand typically intersect to create price discovery, you know, Bitcoin supply is known and predictable. And so that doesn't really become much of a variable with respect to its value. So it's much more of a demand driven asset, which I think, again, is a different lens that folks need to look at it through when thinking about value. And the last point I want to mention, Brad, something we talked about before the, the show started is it's basically the demand is monotonically increasing all the time because people evangelize you and then you buy some and you read some more about it and then you start talking to your coworkers and then they buy some and there are very few people that ever actually just exit the market. And so you're always attract, it's like a one-way valve. You're always attracting buyers and there's very few people that ever sell. And one of the, the my, uh, main thoughts is there's so many incredibly intelligent, you know, uh, professionals like you that once you read about it and you actually spend a couple of days, you end up buying it. And there's really very few people that go, oh, this thing's just a bubble. I'm going to get short. And you occasionally see, you know, a curmudgeon like Warren Buffett, you know, doing a one sentence negative thing about Bitcoin being rat poison. But I've never seen like a multi-page negative report on Bitcoin. 
literally. I've been in this business for nine years and I've never seen anyone actually write a well thought out, very long thing on why one should be short Bitcoin. And that's basically proof that almost everybody that actually does the work ultimately ends up buying it and getting long. And if we all just keep getting long, it probably just grinds up. No, I, well, last thing, I know John has some viewer questions, but do you think it, 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 it grinds up, Dan, and in prior life, I traded oil. And, you know, it seems like in commodities, right, when you have a fixed supply, when the demand comes, it can, it, Michael, whether you like it or not, it, it, it tends to get parabolic. And I agree that, that, that you, you want, you know, buyers to validate higher prices, but doesn't that seem quite possible here? Just given the oh, trade yeah, dynamic? You know, occasionally a bunch of things all come together and it's on, you know, TV all the time and it shoots up, you know, at a rate that's too fast. And, and one of the, the best uh, uh, stats about Bitcoin is it's had a lot of down 80% bear markets. And in, in the normal world, like oil or whatever, that would, that would scare people to death. The wild statistic is in nine years of its existence, Bitcoin's only had one year where the low for the year was below a prior low. So even though it's had five down 80% years, even at down 80%, it's higher than it was the prior year. Um, so Bitcoin's definitely volatile, it's high octane stuff, but it's grinding up at such a, a fast rate that, that you net net come out. And, and anyone that's owned Bitcoin for three and a quarter years has made money. You know, it's one of those things, which is not true. You know, uh, your favorite market oil uh, recently went negative. You had to pay people to take uh, your right. production. And essentially oil hasn't done anything for 30 years. It's basically flat. And so, uh, you know, Bitcoin's the polar opposite of that type of asset class. No, I guess so just to make your point, Michael, I, I think that 20,000 is almost like a straight print, you know, in, in, in an equity trading market. You know, you just don't, it almost shouldn't be counted, right? It was one month up and down. And if you took that off the chart, it looks much healthier, right? The, 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 the upward grind that you guys are sort of talking about. Anyway, John, do we have a question or two? Yeah, I know we, we have, have some emailed questions and some questions in the chat that I think are interesting. Obviously, we have now the uh, the cryptocurrency skeptics lining up to, to poke holes in this Good. Um, conversation about uh, crypto. But the first question is, you know, obviously you had the whole situation with Silk Road and the, some of the origins in terms of public perception of Bitcoin being around uh, sort of the nefarious exchange of money on black markets for things like drugs or whether it be weapons or whatever it may be. Uh, and so it has that perception that continues to dog it. And so how long term will digital, cur digital currencies like Bitcoin overcome that stigma and also overcome real issues like anti-money laundering, uh, tax related issues and other financial regulations? Yeah, John, whoever asked that question respectfully has not looked at Bitcoin recently and they're holding on to some preconceived notions about this. Um, Bitcoin the best ex analogy I can think of is every time somebody uses Bitcoin, it leaves a digital breadcrumb. So it is quite frankly, the worst mechanism possible to use if you wanna do anything the least bit nefarious or something that you wouldn't wanna be known for doing. And today, you know, our parent company, Dan's firm, we've all invested in blockchain forensic and analytical tools, uh, companies that have developed products and services around monitoring tainted addresses, tainted coins, and who are the biggest customers of these companies? The FBI, the CIA, the Treasury, you name it. Um, and so this, this idea that Bitcoin is somehow for the underbelly of the world or nefarious activity is ridiculous, not to mention that you've had now several auctions by the US Marshal Service actually auctioning off Bitcoin that they've seized, right? So if they thought that this was like an illegal um, or illicit asset um, that they were auctioning off to the general public, I have a hard time believing they would be doing that um, if they didn't somehow believe that, you know, this was something that was permissible and was not gonna be saying they were gonna crack down on and that they got the right comfort around the asset in order to conduct multiple auctions. John, I was involved in that prosecution, and the, the truth is actually the exact opposite of what your questioner is, is supposing, is there is a permanent paper trail of every transaction that's ever happened on Bitcoin. It's published every 10 minutes to the public. We all know every transaction that's ever happened. That's really a terrible feature for committing crimes. And in the Silk Road, obviously the Silk Road guy was taking Bitcoin. Everybody knows that. It makes the newspapers a lot. The real story was, you know, 
doesn't sell a lot of newspapers, so not that many people know, is there were two US federal agents on the Silk Road Task Force that went rogue and were actually extorting money from the Silk Road guy and other criminals and laundering it. And they laundered it through five big banks and a big mutual fund complex in the United States. And they also laundered it through Bitstamp, which is the largest exchange in Europe. And I was the chairman of, of Bitstamp at the time. And the CEO said, hey, I think we have a federal agent laundering money on our website. And I'm like, you guys watch too many Tom Cruise movies. That's just not <laughs> happening. And so I went through all the data and I'm like, oh, that's bad. You know, we got to report this. So we reported it to a second federal agent and he quit that day. And I'm like, oh, that's not a good sign. Why, why the federal agent resigned today? And so we reported it to a third one. And the punchline is the first two were stealing money from criminals and laundering it with Bitcoin. And we have every transaction that's ever happened. You could look it up yourself. It's all public. And uh, they pled guilty and immediately sentenced to 10 years in prison. That's the truth of using Bitcoin for committing crimes. It's terrible. Right. So that, that's a, a pretty thorough answer. And, uh, you know, I think it's something <laughs> that uh, the public is still getting comfortable in terms of mass adoption uh, with Bitcoin. But as you said, Fidelity backed, which is you know, affiliated with a large institution, the custody situation, everything's moving in the right direction for certain. Yeah, I, I think if, about if the government had the choice today to approve either Bitcoin or cash, there's no chance they would allow cash. Cash is mega sketchy. People right. do all kinds of bad things with it. And Bitcoin, you know, really is terrible for community. You can't catch coronavirus from Bitcoin, but they say you can transmit it through cash. <laughs> um, I have another question. It's around China. And it's sort of a multi-layered question around China. As I know, in the early life of Bitcoin, as you mentioned, Dan, a popular use case for it was people moving uh, currency out of a country in which they didn't trust the future of that currency. And that I know happened in China. People were evading capital controls. But then China, while at first was attempting to regulate Bitcoin and potentially stamp it out, they realized the power of you know, distributed currencies. And they're now trying to launch a sort of regulated digital currency. Why do you think they went through that evolution? And what do you think, if any, is the future of regulated digital currencies? Would that undermine a truly independent digital currency like Bitcoin? Or do you think it's a step in the right direction in terms of building uh, multiple parallel blockchains that can act as a more efficient means of financial transaction? Yes, yeah, a super important question. So uh, China has very unique nationalistic policies to build uh, state champions in all the different industries, essentially, you know, freezing out Western technologies and replicating them. They're doing the same with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is a global technology and they're essentially replicating it within their own borders. Their announcement of their own national cryptocurrency was not a coincidence. It came out three days after Facebook announced their Libra project, which is a, uh, you know, similar, identical to what China's trying to do. The, uh, it's essentially game on now. Um, China is definitely developing a cryptocurrency that will, uh, they would like it to be the payment rail of their citizens and then obviously their region and maybe the rest of the world. Uh, so now other countries, other regions need to get engaged and roll out a competitor because as much as you would love to get the toothpaste back in the tube, it's out. Like there will be a blockchain payment system in the world. And uh, you know, it's essentially a question who, who you want managing that one. Uh, the other projects um, like stable coins like USDC that Circle does or Facebook's Libra, those will be popular. And the former chairman of the CFTC, Chris Giancarlo, had a great op-ed right after the Chinese announcement. He said, it's our Sputnik moment in currency that, you know, it's now a race between the superpowers of the world and the West should get engaged. Michael, you have anything to add? No, I think one of the big overhangs for a lot of folks has really been that they think that so much of the mining power is concentrated uh, in China. And, you know, we just um, publicly came out with um, one of our subsidiary businesses called Foundry, which is a digital currency mining and staking business and really working to bring a lot of that hash power back to the U.S. Um, you know, the 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 folks that, again, this is kind of similar to folks that may be looking at Bitcoin or digital currencies from a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of that has been shrugged off and this has really been something that has been turned into a global phenomenon and that there is global participation around. So I think over time, you'll see that even more evenly distributed around the world. 
All right, guys, well, we'll leave it there. I think we could go on for several more hours about this topic, and I think we, we're going to need to have you guys back uh, maybe after the election as the regulatory landscape continues to improve and, and uh, maybe Bitcoin continues to trade higher. So it's been a fascinating conversation. Again, it's, a, it's an area that both from a SALT perspective and a SkyBridge perspective is of growing interest to us, and you guys are two pioneers in the space, so it's been a, a real treat to have you guys on. Thank Thanks you. Both. It's been great. John and Brett, thank you.